I was born and raised on Long Island outside of New York City. I think I'm the 32nd in a 42-person cousin gaggle. Um, and most of us grew up together, which was really lovely. I had built-in community right away. And then from a ministry standpoint, my Nana, my dad's mom, uh, was the organist at the local church. Um, and so church in the summer times out at their farm was uh, kind of beautiful because you got to sneak up the little back stairs and watch Nana play her heart out. Church was very much home for me. Um, and I really felt grounded and settled around all the things that happened at a parish church, even from a fairly young age. I went to a prep seminary high school, which uh, there are not a lot of those left in the country. Um, and I don't regret it. It was small, um, made some great friends, had a really good program. And I got to know priests and um, and some retired priests living there, I got to know them as, as real people, which was really nice. From the prep seminary, I did live a kind of sheltered life. And I went to a Jesuit university, Fairfield University in Connecticut, where I both fell out of love with the church and fell back in love with the church. This is 84 to 88. Uh, going to that school was a big world right away. And in the universe of schools, it was fairly small. When I look back at it, I had two tough years of my life, uh, kind of finding, refinding myself in the context. Part of that meant uh, not being as active in church as I would like. But by my junior and senior year, I was running retreats and service trips and things like that. And it, it felt very much like home. After I left school, I had a, I had a, a very lucky, I got a nice job uh, with a great, with a couple, two great firms. Did fairly well, I think. Uh, and it, I had a pretty neat career in publishing. But I knew kind of in my heart that, to use like science fiction-y language, I knew I was, not in the, I was not in my correct timeline, you know? I think a big part of what we talked about before with college, that's where I sort of discovered beer. In hindsight, uh, I know I drank differently than most of my friends did somewhat compulsively, somewhat obsessionally. And I thought it was fun for about 11 years. Right? Um, but through the course of that, and also with my work, my work took me to a lot of dinners and cocktail parties and stuff like that. By the late 90s, I was kind of just shellacked by obsessive drinking. And I nearly lost my job over it. That and some family love, and not necessarily intervention, but concern. Uh, brought me to a place where I, I, I did, I checked myself into a detox uh, facility in New York City. And my employers were really wonderful about it, which meant a lot to me. That was 22 years ago. I'm grateful for a lot of people who intervened for me and helped me, and that's been great. And then, as part of that, was about into a year and a half, two years of sobriety. Uh, I was out at a dinner with two of my friends and we were talking about things and I knew that I, I knew that if in a new way as rebooting my life, that I could not go back to the way it was. One, and literally over the dinner, one of my friends said, well, what did you want to do when you were a kid, when you grew up? And I said, without hesitation, a priest. And they were like, yeah. Through work, I was in Frankfurt at a thing called the Book Fair, Frankfurt Book Fair. I was ripping the books that I was working with, but uh, I kept seeing priests in collars with satchels. And one guy had a laptop. A lot of, there were not a lot of laptops in the world back then. And then I followed them, basically, down an aisle to this gigantic display for Paula's Press. In the next few days, the next few weeks, I really had to come to terms with, I loved the fact that there was a religious community dedicated to media and publishing. And I had spent the last 11 years of my life in media and publishing. So rather than shutting the door on my old life and saying, I'm new and here I go, uh, I was able to say, God has been preparing me for this even when I didn't know it. 
I've been lucky. I have not gotten into a, uh, I don't have a cubicle at Paul's Press. Uh, I get to be on the board of advisors for it, which I'm honored to do. And um, it's, it's, but it's a neat um, kind of starting point, focal point uh, with that particular ministry for what I was not wasting my life doing, what I was doing uh, with some great colleagues, but now in a new way and now to get Jesuit, you know, um, for the greater glory of God, basically. My favorite type of prayer is prayer in the hospital because you're with people at a really low point in their life. I was with a woman in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was a grandmother. There were adult children and grandchildren all over the place, and she was not doing well. She wanted me, I came in, she wanted me to pray with her family. She leans over though, and like, so I come really close to her, and she said, do meal grace. I said, what? I said, just do meal grace. So we all held hands and we all prayed. Bless us, O Lord, and these, guy, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from the Mount of you through Christ our Lord, amen. And everybody joined me for that. And this, this grandmother knew that that was probably the only prayer that they would, they would all know from start to finish of everybody in the room. That was my most profound moment of prayer um, with her as she was caretaking that whole gaggle of people loving her in a sense out of this world. We only have one life to live and I am really grateful that I got, I, I, I'm getting to do this with my one little life. Every time you think you're done, you're not done. Um, every visit at a hospital bed, every confession, every marriage, you know, all of it. It's, it's just, God is writ large in the lives of so many people. And, um, and I get to share in that. And, and I get to help people discern that in their own life.